Okay. Excellent. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Katsi and everybody for inviting me uh, to join this exciting team and um, share some of the work that we are doing. And, and for today, I will just um, talk this uh, topic. They know more than we do, yet we appreciate them less than they deserve as part of decoding uh, local ontologies um, in heritage interpretation and preservation in, uh, in Tanzania as, uh, as, a, as a case study. But as I do that, I, I just want to bring some few questions and some few narratives of what we uh, archaeologists, um, heritage uh, professionals, researchers, or other people who are more or less in the same field um, are doing. And um, I would just, I would just, uh, I, I, I came up with this uh, rough, rough sketch, uh, starting on the top on your um, left hand side. Uh, we, we, we normally begin with the ideas. So when we want to do research, we, we, we have some ideas. We think this is something we need to, to research on. And once we are, we, we are sure with our ideas, we think it's a good idea. We share these ideas with our colleagues. And these colleagues could be um, either at the university or at the museum or somewhere else. And we think uh, they can provide some ideas and some ABCs. If we get some positive and people say, oh, this is something you need to get on, we look for resources. resources. So we would um, write proposals and uh, go to various funding agencies to, to seek for resources. And um, once we submit these uh, proposals, um, the granting, the, the grant uh, providing institutions and um, we, we, we send your proposals to, to, to peers so that they can uh, review and give some comments and give some suggestions what they think uh, the idea whether it should be funded also. and at the end if your research is funded your proposal is funded you just go to to do research you, you do research you produce outputs you make theories uh, present your results to the conferences uh, write articles or, or books and in the process you come up with more problems and then um, uh, go to do research. So this is the cycle uh, which continues to, to operate, uh, particularly in, in many of the academics and many of the researchers, whether we're based at the museum, um, at the research center, at the universities and such kind of things. So the main questions that we needed to ask is why do we do research and whom do we want to benefit from, from our research and, and how can we approach these communities in which we go to conduct research? Uh, um, do, do we approach them as professors, as students, as collaborators, or what kind of uh, strategies do we use? And uh, are the strategies that we use uh, uh, in terms of communicating, approaching the, the, the people much more user-friendly or whatever. So what, what, what I'm saying here is that whatever kind of the process we may go through, we really need to know that uh, the local communities live very close to the heritage sites than whoever is doing research, uh, who is going to the site for just a few uh, days or a few weeks or months if so, and then you leave. And if the local people are staying to the site, we're expecting them that uh, the survival of such sites will depend on them uh, and not somebody else who is living very far away from the research. And therefore, our research and conservation uh, initiatives, they really need to to get support from the local people, uh, collaborate with the local people, uh, because these local people, uh, are, are, are to, use, to use Peter Smith's uh, concept, they are prims inter pares, they are first among among equals. And therefore, if they are the first among equals, the community-based research and, and sharing of research outputs is critical and it needs to be engaged. So uh, I, I, I will share my experience based on how I have practiced the community uh, research, community heritage, and what kind of lessons we can learn from that. But as a matter of uh, historiograph, I, I just want to bring to your attention and specifically basing on, um, on Africa, that um, if you read uh, this edited volume on Prandarings, the Africa's Spirit, um, which came out in the mid-90s, uh, I think 1996, uh, we have some uh, scholars from across the continent who are reporting disappearing of many heritage sites uh, and, 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 and museum objects which were being plundered 
plundered at some point. Uh, there was less care of the heritage sites and therefore several contributors in that volume called for heritage professionals and the other stakeholders to voice up and say that is something which needs to be done here. And um, they raised the level of discourse and consciousness on the routing problem, particularly in West Africa, where many objects were, were, were being uh, plundered and um, people were being denied of their rights and there was less concern. And therefore, contributors in that volume, they just rang a bell for the authorities, um, the government authorities, the commissions and other state orders to come up and say something needs to be done and indeed there were some impact um, based on those voices from uh, researchers and from that we could think of um, several other examples but I could I could cite a few here and I'll take examples from Tanzania um, where I do research and uh, where I come from for instance there were this uh, new partnership for African development in 2001 which came up with deliberate takes and deliberate information on why uh, communities and stakeholders need to come forward and say but again in Tanzania the, the constitution came up uh, of 2005 came up with uh, a section where they point out the need and the desire to make sure that uh, the cultural heritage the archaeological sites they are being protected as part of uh, part and parcel of the national wealth and uh, things which we need to be protected so the same scenario is reflected uh, in the 10 10 year development uh, 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 20 year development plan the development vision 2025 again um, the poverty reduction and development 2010 the policies the tourism they are all mentioning some aspects on the importance of cultural heritage and how it should be protected so because of such kind of voices and and, and because of uh, individual and group initiatives we are seeing some sort of changes whereby um, heritage management institutions they are they are becoming strong the training of um, young people is, is is progressing quite nicely heritage researchers and practitioners are increasingly uh, are increasing significantly the number of people who are becoming archaeologists and heritage professionals they are, they are, they are really increasing compared to what the situation was some some years some years back and uh, at the continent level we see a lot of initiatives for instance agenda 2063 where you have aspiration number five mentioning the the need to look after heritage sites to make sure that things are done uh, contrary to what was happening and um, from the readings that 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 we can cite uh, including this guru of um, or the champion of heritage research in in Africa Peter Schmidt is saying um, what the agendas of academics are doing they they, they do not tally with those of the locals who are uh, site owners who are very close to the site as, as I mentioned previously and therefore Peter Schmidt is proposing a community-based research that the locals have their interest of what they must be investigated and therefore he, he is giving an example of, um, of, of, of the Buhaya community where documentation of all traditions and rituals which are becoming an issue because the aged ones died of HIV AIDS and therefore the young people we are not we are not getting people to narrate them about those studies so he's giving some case studies where people are recommending that they need to document some of the things and to make sure that we have such kind of a scenario uh, if we read this uh, important book edited by Webb and Doro, uh, Shedrach, Chirikul and colleagues, they are proposing something they call an adaptive approach. Uh, this is the approach that we take uh, on board. What is good from the Eastern uh, Western perspective and what is good from um, the local people such that we create a synthesis way of researching, um, interpreting, but as well as preserving preserving the past. And through that kind of perspective, uh, we, we, we have been trying to, 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 do, to do a research, trying to, to, to document, understand what the people are thinking and what are they uh, discussing about this heritage. And uh, I, would, I, I would do uh, a case study just very briefly from from southern Tanzania and I will make reference to main two people uh, two Waze, uh, Waze or Mze is just an elder 
a male, a elder male is the mze. Then uh, we use uh, this mze who is called mze Francis and the other and the other mze. So this mze um, is is a heritage lover from southern uh, Tanzania, and uh, he was and he still he is the employee of uh, the Roman Catholic Church, and for nearly uh, thirty years he was engaged in uh, making sure that he is looking after uh, the pathies, uh, the community pathies, uh, modifying them, uh, um, rehabilitating them, and making sure that these um, uh, local paths or roads, they are passable throughout the year. And in the process of uh, maintaining these roads, um, he came across several human remains. Uh, he documented 25 human skulls, which were uh, on the on the part of the landscape where he was making the road. And it was very keen such that he treated uh, these remains with, with very caution. And um, the caution we are talking about here, he, he organized the team to make sure that these human remains, they are not disturbed, but uh, they are just uh, treated as if uh, they were important key people. And to make sure that he is marking the site, he, he just um, sourced a, a major, a major rock, the one you can see on the picture, and they did initiatives to engrave this rock. Uh, you can see. So they just written some few words saying, uh, "Our colleagues, our forefathers, they are just resting here, and these are people who were killed during the the Arabic period." Uh, this is what they are uh, writing there in in Swahili, and uh, to make sure that it, uh, this site continues to be protected, they created drainage uh, systems so that they could avoid um, erosion. Uh, uh, to make sure that this uh, site, which has got lots of human skulls and the bones, is not eroded by um, by by the moving water and and the rains at end time, and he, he also did uh, initiatives to make sure that on a regular basis they are continuing to look after this particular site without 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 disturbing. And at the end, if 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 we we think of um, his initiatives, we would say he provided some of the initial interpretation and or raised the question to understand who are these people and what exactly they were they were doing. And the second person I want to, to talk about uh, again who is connected to that particular site is this another Mze, another another elder. Uh, Mze, Mze Chale, whom I, I, I call um, the risking man. So uh, this Mze Chale again is from southern Tanzania on the same um, uh, locality, but uh, a bit far from where these human remains um, um, were found. And he was traveling from his home place to another place called Mbinga, a distance of a uh, close to 50 kilometers, and on the way, they passed by the same locality where Mze Francis uh, um, recorded uh, these uh, human remains. And as they were there, they, they encountered exceptional vegetations. They came across several, several ceramics and several bones, which were quite abnormal compared to what kind of other things they were doing. So this, this, this elder guy, uh, Mze Charlie, uh, did his trip but on the way back, I had to look for some information on why this particular locality had got so many bones, so many uh, ceramics, totally different from the places where they visited. So he, 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 he kept asking some questions to some of the people, and he went to the church to see if they had some knowledge. And fortunately, this church connected him the child and him the Francis to talk about this particular scenario. So the, the, the child and the Francis met, they went to the site, they looked at these different objects, and the Francis narrated it to the child about this particular site with the exceptional um, discoveries. So because of that scenario, Mzef Chale, this guy you see here, was very much confused of this scenario, and he wanted to know more. So secretly, he did pick up some bones and some ceramics, and he hid them without um, informing the other people he was just picking up these um, uh, these artifacts. So he took the artifacts with him back to his home, again a distance of uh, 
close to 30 kilometers and he kept these materials in his home so according to him he did not expose these bones to the wife and to the kids because he thought they would consider him as somebody who is uh, practicing uh, traditional uh, activities which are not um, accepted uh, uchawi something which are all witches so to make sure that he is not um, discouraging the family he kept these uh, objects within himself and by the time he was keeping these objects he was looking for for money so that he could travel uh, from Songea to Dar es Salaam to come to the university and showcase these materials so after a few months he managed to get the money and he paid his transport from uh, uh, Songea to Dar es Salaam and the main idea for him to travel was to come to the University of Dar es Salaam and showcase these materials uh, to the people where he thought probably they might they might understand and see what is it so he came to the administration uh, broke and the administration broke thought these are probably things of the past uh, they directed him to the College of uh, Humanities, where uh, fortunately my, my supervisor, Bertram Mapunda, was the principal. So when he came to this office, they stopped and then he showed uh, these objects and say, if if you want to help, we request you to come down and understand what is it exactly. So here the point I'm saying, this gentleman traveled over a thousand kilometers from southern Tanzania to Dar es Salaam to face the university and talk to some people to show them this is what he got through and he wanted people to go and investigate what kind of a love is this which was quite 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 unique and now uh we 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 decided as a team that we really need to to look for some for some resources and then go uh, to the community talk to these people and see what is happening and what this is so we we we, we got some funding and went to the site and we started investigating and collaborating with these people to make sure that we are we, we are getting to know what was it exactly so in terms of in terms of uh, conducting this research we became students and not university professors in the sense that we were learning from them uh, we were hearing from them we adapted what Schmidt and colleagues have called the archaeologies of reasoning and so we, we, we did not again live at our camp but we lived together uh, in the same camp in the same locality in the same housing and we could participate in different uh, uh, local activities which were quite 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 indeed and I would say here that we adopted the local means of living and partly ad abandoned the academic the academic life where would, where somebody would wish probably after work read a particular uh, journal a particular book or engage respond emails and, and so forth so we totally abandoned the academic life and lived the, the local life but we also followed what uh, these local people the two people I mentioned about them the challenge and the Francis directed us to do for instance they, they they said we want to understand much better about the ceramics we are seeing here we needed to visit uh, the rock ceramic production so that we can learn what they are doing which we did in their teachers they said they again recommended we needed to visit the schools and tell them the academic life what we are doing so that we could inspire we also followed that so our our, our research was very much uh, complying with what the local teachers uh, the collaborators wanted us to do and we did it so at the end through that process Process, we are able uh, to map the, 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 the southern uh, caravan route uh, in that particular area you could see on the map but we could also reconstruct the subsistence strategies of rock communities and, and assess the changes of uh, the activities and at the end compare what these people were telling us and uh, what we, we had but also managed to, 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 to publish some of the uh, academic papers try to showcase uh, what the kind of archaeology what the kind of heritage is is there so for the for the interest of time I, I would want to end up there but I would say that um, the local people that we work with they have quite exciting 
uh, interpretations and they have they have knowledge they have um, desires they want their history to be written and understood uh, to the other people so whether what they have and what they give is right or wrong we, we need to capture that and present them and where possible make that kind of narratives part of the historical narratives that we, we document and even when uh, the information we are getting is contrary to the truth to the scientific truth then we really need also to take into board that this is the idea they have this is the knowledge they have it might be uh, good it might be bad but we really need to to take it on board and see what is it and one example here is about this uh, engraved stone where they are talking about these are people um, who died and they were killed by the arab but when we did the excavation and do some dating we see these materials have nothing to do with the arabs because they date the 11th 12th century where the, the Arabic and the slave trade business wasn't the case at that particular area. And uh, we could compare this with what we have done again elsewhere taking an example of uh, Laitori, where the, the local people have got their understanding, they have got their interpretations about who made these footprints and they came up with a hero, a Maasai hero whom they think is the one who made the footprints. We know that by, by, by the time these footprints were being um, happening at Laitori, there were nothing called the Maasai. Uh, there was nothing called the Maasai. The Maasai are just very new to the Ngorongoro landscape. But the narratives and the interpretations of who made this footprint is very critical because soon we have that included in the narratives. We are making them part and parcel of the discussions and therefore it's much better if we have both narratives, the real scientific uh, narratives and the local Maasai narratives recorded and documented and shared as well. So I should say uh, I end up there but there are a couple of um, insights and a couple of issues that we could discuss if somebody wants to hear more about um, what we are doing and how it works could, could, could email me but also we have a lot of things we put on the social media which could be of interest to 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 whoever is doing community archaeology, community heritage and engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ichiro. Okay. Um,